I'd like to call to order the work session on Monday, June 22nd, 2015. It is now 5 o'clock. Just to remind Council, there is a regular meeting that must begin at 6 o'clock following this meeting. So as I look at the table, we're all here this evening. So we have one item on the agenda, and we will be discussing the activities of the Greater Phoenix Economic Council, known to all of us as GPEC. And we will receive an update regarding GPEC's work with Economic Development Department. And to start with it, for the introductions, Michelle Lorry, Economic Development Director, to introduce. Mayor, and thank you, uh, Mayor and Council, for having us here to present this evening. We appreciate the time, and I'm here with, as you said early, with Chris Camacho, our pres the President and CEO of the Greater Phoenix Economic Council, who's going to give us an update on the Community Partnership Program from GPAC. Great. Chris, welcome. Thank you very much, Mayor and Council. It's great to, to be here tonight in a, a balmy 115, I think it was. <laughs> I, I, I admit I parked at the C building and walked to the A, and oh. I, I've lost a few pounds. So um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. I, I will uh, attempt to be brief, uh, but I do want to be comprehensive enough to show uh, the work that we're undertaking at, at GPEC, which, uh, for those of you that don't know, we're a, a public-private partnership that's uh, been... Uh, around since 1989, and the original eight communities uh, were, were put forth together to ultimately uh, align resources and align strategy on the economy. And as a byproduct of that effort, uh, we are now uh, we now have 170 private sector investors as well. So we're a very balanced public-private uh, partnership. And uh, the mayor has uh, uh, been very uh, very tied to our our overall economic system for several years now, serving on. Uh, or as head of our ambassador program, and uh, many of the councilmen have been also participatory in that effort. So uh, with that, I'm going to give you a brief uh, pr uh, presentation, and then we'll kind of just jump in. Uh, you know, if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, so I mentioned the organization. As it stands today, we have 22 cities across the, the metropolitan region, uh, the 4.5 million residents that are represented in this, uh, this regional economy. The reason why organizations like GPEC exist uh, are ultimately that in major markets across the U.S., uh, we compete for new business uh, in markets and trade areas as opposed to cities competing on their own. And so uh, whereas cities will continue to cultivate exchanges with developers and, and retail developers and, and retailers for that matter, our focus is, uh, is primarily on building advanced industry strategies for the marketplace. And that's uh, inducing industrial development, uh, certainly inducing the attraction of uh, industrial operations, but also attracting office users as well. And I'll get into that here momentarily. So again, just to, to reiterate, we're now at 170 private sector investors that uh, accumulate about, uh, I think the latest number I saw was uh, just over 60% of our operating revenue comes from the private sector today. Uh, when I first began with the organization seven years ago, we were um, about 50-50 split. And so we've continued to raise private money to uh, support the, uh, the match by the, uh, the public sector. So just to give you the basic premise of what we do, we're, we're focused on these five core areas. So we, we begin all of the work that we embark upon is with uh, research and strategy. And so, uh, again, our, our primary charter is to drive new investment to the market and build a brand strategy for the regional economy. And all of that's predicated on our ability to uh, perform the research and analytics to help us understand our competitive position. So just imagine any company that's evaluating uh, this metro economy, we're, we're on the front end helping them understand tax environment, labor environment, cost, uh, infrastructure, the readiness of the sites, the building permit process. All of those things are what we do on your behalf on the front end as, as companies are evaluating this metro area. In any given year, we'll have on average about 225 companies that evaluate metropolitan Phoenix, and we convert about 30 to 35 of those companies. I'm just going to interrupt you there because I think it's, I think, Michelle, you can confirm this for a city to do that. Uh, the additional cost to economic development uh, would be extreme. So, to, oh, to do uh, what GPEC does that's at right. the city level, yes, it would, and be much less effective. Yes. yes. I just want to point that out to the public that might be listening, because that's a real advantage of being long to GPEC, is that uh, it would cost us an extraordinary amount, and we, we don't have that kind of amount to put toward it. So, uh, it's a real advantageous for the city, so we thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, and so again, the, the focal point of GPEC is to go outside this market, outside of Metro Phoenix, because the goal is not to have a Phoenix company uh, move to Goodyear, a Goodyear company move to Tempe or, or Peoria or what have you. Our goal is to induce new economic activity from outside the marketplace. So 100% of the work that we do is, is you know, working in California, which I'll talk about, 
uh, you know, in, in markets like Chicago, Boston, New York, and I could spend a lot of time talking about the or origin of our projects, but just to give you a, a quick synopsis of where our projects come from, uh, today 20% are out of the California market, so we have a team that mines the San Francisco Bay Area and assesses all the venture capital trends, all of the uh, information communication technology software activity that's, that's occurring in that marketplace, and creates value propositions for those companies to invest in the Metro Phoenix market. Same thing in downstate in Southern California, uh, there's over 40,000 small, medium-sized uh, enterprises that are on the industrial side that some more support the aerospace and defense sector. We mine that uh, supply chain as well. Uh, just two weeks ago, we had uh, the mayor and, and Michelle join us for a, uh, an event with Senator McCain that he headlined 140 tenant reps and private sector companies that are considering investing in Arizona. And so we put on those, those kind of events that help uh, you get you know, visible face time with, uh, with these companies, but also I gave a, a regional overview of the competitive operating environment uh, of, of operating in Arizona versus California. And so those are the kind of uh, road shows that we execute on your behalf and, and oftentimes with you and, and other mayors across this region or councilmen across this region that are interested in supporting the mission of GPAC. Uh, and then also we, we drive the marketing and promotion side of, of this, uh, this strategy where if you follow anything that we do on social, we're very active in showcasing, you know, the competitive market position for the region and everything from our water position to cost of doing business to the regulatory uh, environment, uh, being a right-to-work state. There's a lot of, you know, different facets of the value proposition that we continuously cover. And I would say this all draws back to the research and analytics abilities where we analyze, again, our competitive position across 50 different indices to help companies really you know, evaluate this marketplace. And so that's really where I, our IP sits. And then we share that information on the right-hand column with all of our uh, members, all of the cities. Uh, we work closely with the governor's office and advise on economic policy. And uh, we're very proud of our, of our work uh, you know, with the state going, uh, and we will continue to work with the state going forward. So I talked a little bit about business attraction. I'll get into the factors of why companies make decisions, but uh, just to give you an idea, the last five years running, we've had 161 projects that have, have uh, are, are considered locates, have moved to the market, 27,000 jobs, uh, you know, pretty significant capital investment and, and absorption. Uh, you know, again, if you look at across this region, we're still sitting at 19% office vacancy. Uh, our industrial vacancies are just around 12%. Uh, and so again, as we're seeing finally new product coming out of the ground, one of the interesting facts about our business is when we have high vacancy rates, we have high levels of interest from outside companies because we have building stock. And, uh, and I'll talk about that in relation to the Goodyear community where, you know, Palm Valley 303, we've had a number of projects go to that location. Some build, uh, others are taking down existing space in your community. But one really interesting point of, of emphasis for GPAC is that we did a seven-year analysis of our work. Over the last seven years, the average uh, company, when they look at this market, 80% look for existing building product. And so when you think about how does your respective community compete, uh, product has become a very interesting and critical part of the overall process for these companies. And, and that's largely attributed to the fact that uh, companies during the downturn were shedding any amount of costs that they could. They shed headcount. And that was, you know, began in 2008, continued to do that in 2012. And as product demand for their product or service came back, you know, generally they were a quarter or two behind uh, the ability to get back to market. And so a lot of the time from 2012 to where we stand today, even today, companies come to us and say, you know, we need a location either in Dallas, Metro Phoenix, or, or Denver, and we need to be operational within four months. We don't have time to build a, you know, a new build, and so we need to move as quickly as possible. You have other examples that probably Dick's Sporting Goods is just one in my mind, a recent example, where they originally came in with that methodology and then ultimately could build a building in, in nine months and you know, our ability to convert the permits as quickly as, as the market did, we were able to, you know, ultimately meet their, their operational time frame. So, you know, again, having existing product really helps. Focal point B, you know, 100% about customer service is absolutely necessary. Uh, in today's environment where any company has, you know, multiple options, multiple supply chains, multiple labor markets they can pull from, uh, the ability for us to compete just as much as it is about cost, it's about the service we provide to our clients. And so, you know, that's something we've been very, uh, very Can focused on. Can I interject here? But what about shovel ready? And, um, and along with that, uh, how important is it for cities to take the lead to do some of the infrastructure that needs to be done 
that attracts them because that's always the hard thing with council to put the money in something under the ground that nobody sees. Um, and so, and, and then they feel like they're going to be uh, caught with the cost. They're, they're not going to get repaid back. And those are the, those are the two things that I, I'd love to have you address. Sure. Mayor and council. So in regards to infrastructure, yeah, the, again, the site readiness is much like your existing building stock. And so if a company comes in, some do come in and say, I want an existing building and then ultimately look at dirt. But the reality is if, if you don't have a site with ready infrastructure, but, you know, quote unquote shovel ready with you know, requisite water, wastewater lines, even assessing your capacities to your wastewater and water treatment facilities. Uh, and then also all of your electri electrical and gas infrastructure. There's so many options across the, across the Southwest that have that infrastructure. It's a risk mitigation, um, you know, review for these clients and these companies. And so uh, the more you invest in a thoughtful way around employment centers, employment building, because they want to be in concentrated pre-planned designated areas that are, that are really, you know, have active uh, ingress and egress, those are the, the critical infrastructure factors for you to compete on. So does the company look at that like, at that like it's an incentive? So, I mean, you know, when they come in, then, then we're sitting at the table and looking at incentives. So uh, how does that play into that formula? Yeah, Mayor and Council, the, the, the focus of these companies is, first and foremost, is that they have to have a clear pathway to occupancy. The second is they're going to go about their clear pathway to occupancy to mitigate the risk. And their third is going to be the factors consideration on cost. And so if you don't have each of these factors uh, in your community, again, you know, built out commerce parks um, that have the, the ready infrastructure, they're going to move to a site that has that. And it's, it's an unfortunately or maybe fortunately, no longer the days are, are projects completed, you know, in the back of a smoky room with the mayor uh, on a piece of dirt that doesn't have any infrastructure. Those deals just don't exist anymore. Uh, and what does exist are companies going through an intense amount of due diligence on the front end to ensure all the infrastructure there, the labor shed and commute shed of your labor uh, pool that surrounds that, that site and vicinity uh, has the, the appropriate labor that supports their, their occupation. Otherwise, they'll, they'll move to an alternative location uh, to occupy. Joanne? Well, you kind of answered the question, but I mean, I know that, that you have events where you have um, site selectors come in and, and talk about, you know, what has been the allure of different um, locates and things like that. But, I, but I'm kind of curious, do you ever have, um, even if it was annually, a, t a time where you bring in really investors and, and kind of clue them into areas where um, there isn't anything built and for spec buildings or things like that? I mean, I know it took a long time for our Suncor building to finally, you know, which is um, now a great, you know, facility, but... That was also during the recession, but now going forward, is, is that ever an idea to, to really talk to investors? Yeah, Councilman Osborne and, and Council. So uh, in regards to the real estate investment trust market and developer market, we actually have an outbound national strategy that we've built into our sales channels because a number of our West Valley communities uh, specifically have these planned employment corridors but don't have the capital acquisition ability or the partners ultimately uh, to construct new facilities. And... Uh, I will tell you, we've, we've, we put something together very specifically for this real estate uh, investment group to focus on all the data that we know that we get asked in advance so that, you know, we've head off a lot of the questions that they may have. Because, again, if you're talking to an industrial REIT that uh, is, is considering a western U.S. building, a new, new building, they're going to look at the region, they're going to look at the vacancies, they're going to look at absor absorption trends, uh, they're going to look at rents. And all of the data, we're, we're preemptively, we've pulled it all together, and we use that. Our industrial team is, is outbound nationally selling those opportunities. And we went through each of our economic development directors. I think there's, there's 60 sites that uh, we've convened that are industrial ready and um, in, in terms of the site itself that communities are interested in submitting to us that then we go before these real estate investment trusts to gain you know, marketing visibility with the intent of bringing more of them to the market to do new builds. Thank you. Bill? Chris, on, you had, uh, and I think this kind of piggybacks on uh, Councilmember Osborne's question, that um, cities themselves are not building industrial parks. So the shovel-ready project, et cetera, really is having uh, a, a, an area like PV303 or um, the area that is immediately south of us here, um, to have those ready. Those aren't being built by cities. So I, it, for me, it's actually encouraging that 
you know, you're working to try to find people who are willing to kind of develop that. Um, I think the challenge for the cities has always been growth pays for growth. And uh, here we are with a lot of land that hasn't paid for itself. And, and the investment that's required for, on, you know, with public funds to get that is pretty significant. Mm -hmm. So are, are you seeing any change in that? Councilman, what I, what I do see are cities that are in your position that you know, certainly don't have a lot of office stock, building product, uh, some industrial stock. You're seeing that they're looking at unique public-private partnerships to induce the private sector to come in and build on the site. And that might be um, in a number of our communities across the region, you've seen funds that um, obligated collections of you know, a portion of the construction sales tax, future construction sales tax as an example, uh, to create a fund ultimately to uh, place dollars into capital improvements, I, I, you know, i.e. infrastructure, so that you, you've planned out these, these land areas such that the private sector can come to the table and have a turnkey site, and then it's a public-private partnership to build you know, and erect the facility uh, that then the city can go out and market. Because that is, you know, unfortunately, some of the West Valley communities are in a very similar position mm -hmm. when you don't have the product. Now, you know, during the upswing from really 05 to 08, uh, or even late 07, you saw a lot of development occur here. Now, it, it happened sporadically across the valley. Some of it was centralized in the Chandler. And as, as I look at, you know, the last several years of uh, transactions or locates, they've gone to existing building stock where those buildings were. And so I get the question oftentimes, you know, would, would, the, would the result have been different if we had the building uh, as opposed to not having the building? Because when you're in the process, when you don't have the building and the consultant or the company comes through and they say, well, we like the community, but we don't, the building stock's not there and we can only wait three months to occupy they go through and eliminate that, that site or that community. And so I do think that's really important. And if I'm advising you, I would be exploring that opportunity to look at a partnership uh, you know, with developers uh, that are keen to this submarket, that are um, you know, wishing to build. And you have a number of, of solid builders already in your community that have taken that risk, and several have been successful. But the build-to-suit market is, is really where we still stand, meaning, you know, They'll, they'll build to suit for a specific client, not necessarily building on spec, even though there's, um, I think the latest number I saw, there were six buildings over 400,000 square feet. And when we have existing building stock, we get a lot of interest out of uh, the Southern California market because we have that product. Thanks. Jerry? <coughs> Another issue that I, I've heard on the news and maybe you could speak to is like they say that in some areas, like in, in the Phoenix market, we don't have the labor force or the skills for some of the companies looking to move. Can you speak to that or what we can do for that? Yeah, Councilman. So labor comes up just as much as infrastructure. And, you know, we've worked with, uh, with Westmark and, and other West Valley communities on quantifying the commute shed. And what I find interesting is a lot of our West Valley cities have an out-commute pattern that are over 80%, meaning 80% of their residents go somewhere else to work. And I know you're in that similar vicinity. <laughs> And, and I think what's, what's really prudent is to ensure that you, you know, we, we collectively measure the, the level and quality of labor because it's there. I'm 100% convinced the labor shed in the West Valley um, to attract any, any of the employers are here. And you have some legacy industries you know, that have been here for years and others that are you know, newer industries to this, uh, this, this particular submarket. But the, the, what it comes back to is being able to model. And here's you know, what we found, because we, again, dice labor, probably more labor data more than most, is if you look at, you know, the traditional BLS labor and the top line labor sets, they're generally a few years behind. Um, but what we've asked Westmark and other, you know, peer groups to do is really assess, you know, really by employer and finding out where do the employees live so you can really draw out localized commute sheds because that's what you have to compete on. You have to be able to showcase that the labor pools are there and, and really quantify those and map those. And so... Uh, I think you're actually in a great you know, position as a community. You have great you know, housing availability and different levels of stock. Uh, but I think proving your labor pool is really important. Okay, I'll, I'll move on uh, to the next few. So we, talk, we touched on this just a touch, but you know, the top ten factors uh, to site selection, when I go out to communities, I, I usually spend <laughs> a half hour talking about this ten-point ten, uh, box here. But uh, you know, when, I, when I began in St. Louis, uh, my career, um, you know, the main focal point of this, you know, this, these statistics or these uh, top 10 were, were about, you know, transportation nodes. So where, where were the main interstates? 
and then it was about infrastructure. Those were the two key, you know, attributes. And all these other things are very relevant, you know, in terms of your, your incentive position, your corporate tax rates, you know, buildings as we talked about. But number one, this, this skilled labor, and really it's two-year technical labor, has elevated itself, and I would almost say has distanced itself as the far number one position. Because in this environment, excuse me, where uh, companies have more options than they ever have before internationally, globally to access, you know, shipping, transportation modes to supply chain, uh, you know, the ability to produce labor has been uh, elevated to the top. And it's not just uh, how many people do you have working in a certain standard occupational code, it's how long have they been working in that standard occupational code. So the Metro Phoenix market in comparison is really strong horizontally, which, which simply means we have, you know, a lot of, you know, zero to, to eight year employees in a certain industry. It's when you get to the eight to 20 year experienced worker, you know, that's where we see how the markets you know, actually outpace our region. And so uh, our ability to produce people at, at the, you know, Estrella, Estrella Community College at really the, the entire community college network, um, you know, certainly at ASU, uh, that is really what uh, companies are measuring more so than ever before today. We're having to get to you know, much more meaningful levels of, uh, of depth of information. So, you know, again, I'd say the other, you know, major change has been, again, I go back to the theme of companies having options. It's the abilities for the cities, and that's uh, cities, counties, and state, and it could be everything from air quality permits to how the state manages a permit to local control. Uh, having a pro-business attitude and being problem solvers are absolutely critical. And I, I can tell you, <coughs> and I won't name them, but there's been other communities, not this one, fortunately for you, but I've sat in where uh, it was almost like the city wanted to set up every roadblock uh, for the company that was trying to enter. And ultimately, you know, the company didn't move forward in this market. And so having, you know, really top down from your city manager who has an, I know has an economic development background, uh, you know, having that type of reception for companies is absolutely critical. So moving on, we have a question. You mentioned the ability of labor force is, is number one. And I'm also, um, I'm an adjunct professor at the community college, and I know they have outreach. But do you have any specific programs that you're growing to try to match up programs at, say, the community college to the actual needs and desires of the industry out there? Uh, to me, some of the biggest problems I see out there is, at least from an educational standpoint, is some are getting degrees in various things that aren't matching up to what's being demanded out there. And, and I assume you're in a position to find out what type of skill sets is being asked for out there, and maybe with a collaboration with Ernie or doc, Dr. Lauren or, or Clay over there is to try to develop some programs so you grow, we grow internally some of those students with that skill set so that we do kind of grow some of that labor pool. Thoughts on, thoughts on that? Uh, Councilman, yeah, we've, we've been very active, both uh, Rufus Glasper's on our, on our board, but also Randy Kimmons and others within the Community College Network. Really not necessarily, you know, college by college per se or campus by campus, but showcasing where, where we see the jobs are to really ensure that, because again, every day we are matching, here's the level of quantifiable evidence of a particular, it could be a welder, could be a programmatic logic control, could be another curriculum of, of the two-year technical uh, person going through that system, and we're quantifying that level of, of output because that's what the client asked for. But we're also sharing back with, uh, with the community college, you know, not only the, the breakdown, which I'll talk about here in a minute, the breakdown of our projects, but even, I think even more important than that is where the jobs are in the metro economy. And because, again, when you look at, if you break down this, this metro economy, you'll find that, um, you know, GPEC will, will generally have an impact on about 15% of the overall performance. So that means 85% is coming from somewhere else, you know, meaning jobs are being grown in this market. The difference is our jobs that we're supporting are all net new, and on average they're paying twice the, the county median wage. Now, when you get to, you know, back to your question, what, we are, what we're continuously doing is measuring the supply-demand equation and sharing that information back with the community college in terms of what's in our pipeline, because we're about a 9- to 12-month leading indicator of the trends that are occurring. So I'd love to follow up further and talk, uh, you know, about the data we have and make sure that each of the community college uh, leaders have access to that information. Yeah, I, I appreciate that because to me to grow the economy itself is we got to match those coming out and having the skill sets to go right into the uh, workforce. And I'm not sure to be honest with you, we're doing that great of a job doing that right now. So, um, and, and you're in an excellent position to know where that's going and, or what those demands are out there. And I think the uh, community colleges a lot of them, or like Westmec or some of the skill centers, have a, 
have that ability to uh, create those programs to meet the needs of these people coming in here as long as everybody's on the same page. So, yeah, I think there's some value if, if we try to figure out a way of, of trying to do that match. So yeah. I, I appreciate the feedback. Yeah, and Councilman, one, one other additional comment. So we convened, um, GPEC created a Council on Competitiveness recently, and we convened 15 of the top uh, advanced industry uh, leaders in this marketplace that represented, those 15 companies represented 100,000 employees in this market, in the region, with the goal of really trying to grasp what were the, their views of, you know, advantages of operating here and some of the challenges. And the, uh, you know, the two, the two recommendations or two items that there was consensus on was, number one, uh, the two-year technical trades are the critical linchpin to the base industry's success. Are we producing enough technical people uh, that are aligned with future jobs demands? And that was number one. And the second was the integration of uh, the Latino community into the marketplace. And, and so we have, you know, there's several other strategies we'll be working on as well, but that was, you know, their, their top one by far was how do we ensure that we, you know, have the trade skills match with the, the impending need. Thank you. So I, I covered this slide already, but just to give you a visual depiction of where our projects come from, as you, you would probably suspect, our neighbor to the west has you know, done a lot of favors to us over the last few years of creating an environment that's not, a, not exactly attractive for business. Um, I will say when we went into the California you know, market with the message we had was very uh, pro-California, and that is the economy expands in California, uh, we are going to see an incredible amount of job creation tied to California-based companies. And, I don't have to tell you how many major corporations there are that have secondary facilities here that have billions of dollars of investments in Arizona. So we, we play a very pro-California message because we know these California companies will, will leave the market on their own or expand outside the market on their own. And the second is uh, Texas and, and Chicago. So a breakdown of our, of our industries, uh, just to spend a few moments. Uh, manufacturing is, is the largest uh, slice of the pie. Uh, and then advanced business services, and that's everything from headquarters to uh, advanced IT, information technology, or could be administrative services uh, operation within a company. And that's really what this market historically uh, across the region has been uh, anchored by, uh, has been a lot of the back office functions of major uh, fortune uh, operations. The two major trends that have evolved and that really in the last uh, 12 months, uh, you'll see the, the slice on software. That is up dramatically as... Uh, our market's very well positioned on software, and we, we do a lot of analysis, as I mentioned, on each vertical or each industry. And just to give you a, you know, a quick bullet point if you're talking to a software company, because I didn't know this before we did this analysis, is that we have a larger uh, software base of occupations in Metro Phoenix than uh, Metro Denver or Metro Austin has. And the projection over the next five years is that this market is going to grow at a faster pace uh, by percentage than both of those markets, respectively. Joanne? This is a very interesting slide, and I and this may have been done for our city, and if we have, it would be great to see it again. Um, if we haven't, it would be great to do. And, uh, you know, it's, it's funny, uh, after the weekend that I've just had, um, that I'll talk about later, uh, but one of the, the interesting points that came up about um, innovation and uh, infrastructure, the innovation infrastructure of good, of just Arizona, you know, and you compare it to Austin, for example, it doesn't happen overnight. And, you know, it took 20 years for Austin to become what they are. And so I think sometimes we have to always remember that and we can't give up and we have to continue to, to just, you know, um, help these companies thrive and, and, and not give up. But, you know, I know it's great to hear what you just said because it kind of, you know, emphasizes that we're not Austin, but we're still, you know, working on it and eventually we'll get there. And I would also say, you know, from a PR and branding perspective, I don't think we, we have, as a market, done a very good job of, of grasping our market position relative to software and startups. And so we've really embarked upon a major PR campaign across the region and, and placed this nationally to showcase our position on, on startups. Because that is, you know, this is a, a market of startups. This, this region, or, or the state, I should say, is 98% small business. And... Uh, so that's something that's very important. The other trend I, I just want to briefly touch on is uh, transportation distribution uh, and, and tied to manufacturing. You know, this is with, with PV303, and I've shared this with my economic development director colleagues, is that you know, this, this whole new corridor connected you know, via transportation is opening and unlocking you know, with infrastructure a new corridor for the West. And you know, one thing I want to be very thoughtful about is how that, that, that whole corridor gets developed and that we're very... Um, intuitive and, and 
thoughtful about you know ensuring that we have the right job composition uh, being developed across that area because again we want to see you know more advanced manufacturing more export industry uh, that gets built in in the West Valley and, and particularly that uh, 303 corridor and uh, so we were aggressively pursuing a number of aerospace supply chain companies to uh, you know number of MROs that, that are looking at airports across the West Valley to uh, a lot of the logistics facilities that are no longer just the pick pack facilities that they used to be. There's a lot of automation and uh, pretty significant capital investment that go into these uh, logistics facilities as well. So I know I'm running short on time here, uh, but I, I will uh, finish. Well, we've up. asked a lot of questions, that's, so that's, that's not a problem. So, you know, again, just these are the when I when I look at business attraction and how we support our communities specifically as we build community profiles based around the information that our clients, uh, you know, generally ask for. So. You have your kind of your your general value proposition related to an industry, but then you have your community attributes, and so we work with Michelle on, on articulating what makes you know Goodyear specifically different in terms of your culture, your your art scene, your downtown, your livability options, and so forth. And we place this through a social media strategy that I see every day going out on my Twitter feed, Sherry, and then also excuse me, Sherry. <laughs> sorry, I have another question. Um, We've heard a lot in Arizona about our education being last. Is that something that, um, and even the lack of funding for our state universities, is that something that companies are concerned about when they reach out to you? Yeah, Councilman. So education and, you know, again, there's no hiding behind the number that we're 48th in spending. And uh, that comes up virtually in every conversation we have with, uh, with corporations evaluating the market now. There is a conversation you have about, you, you can have, I should say, about you know cho school choice options, about finding the good schools, public schools. There's great public schools across the region. There's great private options, great charter options, which are public. Um, and, and we talk about those. And, and, uh, but we also have an in-market conversation about the aggregate performance. And uh, again, as a leader in this you know, community and, and one that's focused heavily on the economy, you know, the ability to produce you know, an educated you know, K through 12 system or, or the outcome of a K through 12 system that has high educational attainment is a direct correlation to a future workforce, which is a direct correlation to a future economic you know, performance in an economy. And so, you know, to your question, that's something that comes up. We work to address it. We've been very vocal that we'd like to see, you know, continued support of the education system in Arizona, because uh, that is one of the critical factors that we compete on. And on your post-secondary question, you know, the community college, you know, for the last seven years has had reduced spending from the state, and this was the first year that uh, there's been 100%, you know, uh, elimination, I should say, of, of funding. And, you know, same thing on the, uh, the post-secondary side where, you know, when you compete on, on talent and people and delivering people to the marketplace, that is something that, you know, what we do is we showcase here's what other markets are doing. And I will tell you, corporate America is paying attention. And so we have to do everything we can to, uh, you know, showcase the importance of education to an economic, uh, you know, output. Joe? Um, are there any other measurements? I know we're, we're at the very bottom on spending, but are there any other me uh, measurements out there? How do we fare as far as the quality or the education? I, I don't know what the term I'm looking for as far as the quality of the student coming out prepared to go into college. Are there any testing or anything to see where we are in that rank? Because sometimes, you know, spending is good, don't get me wrong, but sometimes spending and the results don't always match. So I was just curious overall how we're coming out as far as our students are concerned. Because like you say, there's a lot of choice. There's charter schools, there's private schools, et cetera. I'd be curious if there's anybody capturing those numbers and where we rank from that perspective. Yeah, Councilman, I'll be happy to share that with you. I can follow up because there's, there's no one indices that measures performance in, uh, you know, across the K-12 through system. So you can measure educational attainment. You can measure, you know, placement that goes on to a two-year or four-year school. Um, you know, what, what, uh, you know, when I look at these statistics and the different rankings, the kind of the averages were between 20th and 25th in overall performance. Um, so again, we have, you know, an, an average uh, ranking overall, uh, but we spend less. And so there's been a lot of debate about if you, you know, there's, there's, you know, I applaud the governor of, of coming up with a new plan of, of putting 1.8 billion. It's going to go to the voters for their decision, um, you know, ultimately this fall to uh, place resources back into the K through 12 system. Uh, but there is no direct correlation per se of okay. spending to guaranteed outcomes. And then what the difference is too is you have a really high population of uh, English second language learners that are in this marketplace as well. 
um, that create you know a different kind of methodology for how we deliver curriculum here. But uh, that is something again that we've you know again it's one of those where we, we can sell our way and when we're recruiting companies into the top attributes like you know we have three of the top ten schools uh, in the country here in Arizona. Uh, but again, we also there's there's been uh, groups that'll you know go through A through F schools and you can map those people have mapped them before. And uh, there's A schools across the region, there's F schools across the region. And not to spend too much time on this, but I do think it's important when I look at, you know, the health of the urban school district, you have, you know, less than 10% of them moving on to, you know, post-secondary, some sort of certification. And uh, that is the, the urban health of, a, of, a, of, a, of an economy. And so, again, we're, I think we have to continue to focus on outcomes and, and spending is part of that, but not the only. All right, so I will uh, I'll move on. I think I touched on just quickly RFI and site packets. So just one thing to clarify. So when, when we bring in any one of these 200, 200 plus companies that are evaluating the market, we'll work with Michelle just from a process standpoint. And so every time we bring in a client uh, that's, that's new to the market, you'll have the opportunity to provide your information to them. Uh, and so what we do is we, we convene all of the information relative to uh, the industry value proposition We'll work with our state partners, Arizona Commerce Authority, if there's programs that they want to access. Then work with each, each of our commu uh, local communities on letters of support and uh, your own individual value proposition. We collect all of that information, regionalize it, and then submit that to our clients. That's how the process works. So the rest of uh, my, my last few slides here, it's, you know, I want to just give you kind of big picture of what's happening. And you know what, what you're going to see over the next decade distinctions of those markets that are going to be performing markets and those that are going to fall further behind. And so much like you hear about, you know, political uh, conjecture about winners and losers, the winners are going to be markets that uh, induce a much stronger advanced industry position, which is defined by export, uh, export industry that have, you know, a STEM proficiency, uh, how you connect your innovation ecosystem, like we talked about before, creating resources for the startup community and then producing you know, people at the end of the day. And so the shift in our, uh, in our how we compete is less about cost. So you know, this, this old mantra of being the low cost leader, you know, we have, I was just in Mexico City with the governor this last week, and you know, the Mexican economy is poised to become the fifth largest economy in the world in the next 20 years. And you know, they're considered one of the most dynamic yet cost effective economies. And the difference that I foresee in how our market's gonna have to compete it's no longer going to just be about low cost to California, but how, how are we producing talent that's comparable to California? It may be lower cost, but same level of, of competency and within, you know, within the talent regimen. And then also a focus you know, less on consumption in the old economy, more on advanced industry. So again, if you look at the 330,000 jobs that we lost in this regional economy, we recovered about 85% of those jobs lost. And a majority of those jobs, however, are still tied to consumption-based industry which is generally growth in nature, growth related. And so again, we need to find and, and lure and drive and create more jobs that uh, have an indirect multiplier effect that then create the service now jobs, not service jobs driving our economy. And then lastly, you know, inter-region cooperation as opposed to competition. And I think we actually do, we actually do really well compared to our peer markets nationally. Bill? In that regard. Chris, go to your next slide. Okay, uh, go back if you don't mind. <clears throat> <laughs> so on the economy, today I uh, read some information about the state's GDP and how we've really fallen very flat um, and that uh, we're one of only eight states in the nation who haven't grown their GDP. Um, what kind of impact is that having on location, uh, you know, site locations or, uh, you know, from out of state. I mean, we're getting, I think we're getting some movement within the state from place to place, but how does that affect us? Hey, Councilman, so, you know, the, the GDP per capita position has been contracting since the 80s in this market, meaning, you know, the individual production of the person is, has been decreasing um, against the overall GDP. So GDP continues to grow because we're a market that's growing. Uh, but what, what you have to really analyze is, you know, how do companies react to that? They react that we're a big back office market where you can find, you know, pretty quality labor at the mid skill set. Where I think we fall behind is that you have 
markets that have higher concentrations of applied research and higher concentrations of, you know, legacy manufacturing where you have stronger supply chains that are built, those are the markets that are going to be the stickiest, quote unquote, stickiest in the future because they're going to have the inherent labor force and they're going to have the supply chains already built and they're going to have the compelling research that's being translated from the universities. And so not to say we don't have major moves in that space, but we're just further behind because we're a younger market. And so, you know, what I always you know, like to tell our board, because they brought up that, that's a very intuitive question, is, you know, we're fortunate we're not a Midwestern Rust Belt city, no offense to anyone from there, but I am, where, you know, you're seeing contraction in those markets, you're seeing net out-migration from people in those markets, and the upside is that we're going to continue to grow, which is positive, but we have to build, uh, you know, an intentional move on the economy that's centered around applied research, centered around exports, around the innovation economy, because other markets around us are doing that. There was a uh, a report last week that came out that said the top uh, of the top 15 regions and uh, percentage job growth in advanced industries, three were in Utah. So Utah is one of the economies that 10 years ago was not on the map. Today is very, very heavily on the map. And so again, what GPAC in my mind is, is I you know took over, you know, I guess it was six months ago now. Yes, we, we need to do business attraction very well. We need to build the brand strategy very well. And, and both of those supported by data analytics. But we need to be the group that convenes the conversation about competition and competitiveness. And so that's where we're going to bring all these items that you just brought forward or these topics. You so as a local entity, you know, we're, uh, you're working, you know, for us at times and at times literally you're working against us because you're trying to bring someone also into the market, which is effectively our competitors as well. So for us as a city, um, is there, we can't do a lot to affect the, the, the research capacity and, you know, the things that, that the state typically does for us. So should we be taking a, a, a different approach to some of our economic development strategy by, by kind of embracing what we already have, owning what we have and going after that? And, uh, and as the rest of the, you know, I'm going to look at it as the, as the snowball starts rolling and gets bigger and bigger, then we can, you know, we want to stay attached to it. But, are, you know, do you see where I'm kind of driving with that? Yeah, Councilman. So, you know, in, in regards to, you know, localized strategy, so most of what I talked about is, you know, our state-led mm -hmm. um, in, in most other markets. And what, what GPEC will continue to do to raise the conversation about what we need to do to compete. Now, what can you control? Um, you know, when I look at, again, we work for you. We are, we are contracted by you to support the attraction of new companies. And as we're out working with, with these companies, their needs generally come down to, do we want to be in Metro Phoenix or not? If we do, what you can control is everything we've talked about. We, you can control your speed to market abilities on your permits. You can control your infrastructure readiness. And that's how you pre-plan with your capital improvement project uh, monies. And then how do you build employment centers, um, you know, that, you know, are, are well thought out and you have the private sector at the table with you to invest in those, in those sites. Those are really the things that you can control. I'd say the only other thing that I do see, and I, I didn't see this three years ago, but I'm seeing it you know, pretty regularly now with, with communities, where you have obligated, um, much like you know, Phoenix moved forward with this uh, capture on construction sales tax percentage of the net aggregate, and they're putting this money into an annual pot that they're using for economic development. And that could be for, um, you know, closing a, a gap against another market. It could be for investing in infrastructure. It could be for, you know, specific job training, because we don't have a job training program any longer at the state. It could be uh, specific workforce development strategies. It could be for your incubators, acceleration uh, interests. But I'm seeing more of those kind of funds being created. So you have more local control on your, on your destiny or your, you know, intentional moves, as I talked about. So right. those would be things I'd recommend. Thank you. Okay, so just to finish here, uh, you know, we're the largest portion of the, uh, the economy. I, it's probably no surprise to you uh, where a majority of the economic output in the state takes place. And these are the things I mentioned on regional competitiveness. And we have a mayor's meeting that we hold quarterly, and we talk about these issues. We have a community building consortium that's a network of 60 architects, engineers, development partners, where we go through, you know, how the cities are, are performing on, you know, competitiveness related to, uh, permitting and planning and, and development and so forth, um, you know, ready real estate. So we go through this kind of analysis on every one of these core areas of how we compete. 
And the next area I talked about this, so I won't spend any more time on it, but you know, it's going to be, you know, regions, regional strategies are, are the future. Councilman, you talked about, you know, relying on the state. I will tell you that, you know, the strongest regional economies are building regional strategies today. And if you look, and, and I'll share this in the future, but there, there's been 15 different uh, public-private investment strategies led by regions across the country that are anchored in everything I talked about. Because we're seeing less federal, federal, uh, rely, you know, relying, I guess, relying on the federal government through funds of uh, National Science Foundation or NIH or other, you know, DoD monies that have been available historically are no longer there. Um, you've seen states had to pull back on their participation in economic development strategies because the, the resources are no longer there. So regions are now becoming the preeminent leader and, and thought leaders on on economies, and that's you know what GPEC has certainly morphed into. So this is you know, what's on the horizon. What we're doing tonight is the community partnership program. Usually it's, I want to hear from you and your thoughts, and I've got a lot of the great questions tonight. Uh, we launched our competitiveness think tank, as I mentioned. Um, one of the areas that I really think G, you know, GPEC and really the market it needs to do a better job on are really these two things, Corporate 100 and market intelligence, which is on the right-hand side, which that, that's a generic you know, term for retention expansion, how we interact with our industries in an intentional way so that our communities really have the right you know, and relevant research at their disposal to interact with corporations because that's not necessarily what they do every day. Uh, but that's something I've been working uh, with Phoenix Forward. Greater Phoenix Chamber is, is embarking upon an effort there that you know, we're ass assessing how we can play a role in the research and analytics side since that's what our competency, uh, competency is. And then really my, my emphasis going forward as well is, you know, really ramping up the PR machine for the region and ensuring that we're telling the positive stories. And we've had, you know, a hard few years of the brand being damaged in this, uh, in this market. And part of me going on the Mexico City trip, I had a chance to you know, meet with a lot of the, uh, the government officials in Mexico. And we've talked about, you know, real Arizona and what we're about and hopefully a new day for Arizona. And, uh, Mexican trade is at its highest it's ever been and grew 27% in the first quarter. So we're out there actively and visibly, you know, creating a very strong positive communication platform for uh, for you and for the region. So, uh, and then the ROI for the community, I think we've had eight projects, if I remember right, in the last uh, eight or nine projects in the last five years that have, uh, you know, landed in this, uh, in this community, which is higher than most other communities, uh, certainly in the West Valley. And uh, the return on investment, so you provide GPEC resources in the form of a uh, per capita flat rate uh, by your resident number. Uh, and that's how all our communities participate in GPEC. And you're receiving an, an $8 uh, per every dollar you put in return in direct tax revenue. Um, that's provided by the projects that we participate in. So with that, any, any questions or thoughts? The or last comments? slide, would you get that to the council? OK, the, the figures on the last slide, all right? Because we don't have it on our presentation. OK. Uh, comments to Chris, Joe. I don't know if it's so much for for Chris. Maybe it is, or or, or Michelle. Do we have a challenge? Because I I know there are developers in the city that don't want to sell. They want to sit and sit on their land because they think longer term they're going to make more money on it. Is that a challenge you have in trying to match up? Because I I kind of see um, our economic development and the role is almost like uh, Match dot com. You match up the developers to you know, the clients, all right? And you've got to get the right match so they have the right infrastructure, they have the right building, or whatever the case may be. But if you have the, one of the clients that wants to sit on the land, and we do have some developers here that have large parcels of land, okay, then that could be a, a challenge. Is, is, are you finding that or, or, or not the case? I think that in, in my, I'm as well been here six months, so I think in my, in my time here, I, I find that in, in talking with others that that is a challenge, but I think that's one of the things that we have to do as a department um, is be more aggressive in meeting with our landowners and, and developers that are in the community and actually um, reaching out to them just like we would prospect our client. Um, it's, it's the same type of activity that we need to do, and I think that's been done very well by the department before, but I think we just need to be more aggressive with, with what we're doing that way. Okay, thank you. And I think there's a pathway of uh, old communication that had taken part, taken place with some of these developers, and that did influence some of them to sit. And so I think we're going to be over, I think we've had a couple conversations. Um, city manager, you know what I'm referring to, that we're, it was positive to know uh, why they felt they were why they felt the, the way that they were at that time. And so, but we see some advances to 
moving forward. So I, I see some positive. Wally? Well, I, I would like very much to have this discussion at our retreat so that we as a council can sit down and talk about private partnerships, if in fact, because the information that Chris has shared, um, I have attended most of his ambassador programs and I've heard the site selectors and I've heard all of this and it all makes sense, but I think we as a city need to be on the same page so that we can assist in the economic development and, and, and assist in getting partnerships so that we do have some of the shovel ready or at least we know what we want, where we want to go. Because I feel like sometimes we're just standing on the sidewalk watching everybody go by because we're not ready. We're ready, but we're not ready. So thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Bill? On the last, uh, the last slide, the, uh, you know, your uh, return on investment, we participate in an awful lot of regional you know, partnership activities and and there's always an annual fee that you know is associated with that etc and uh, I would say that you know GPEC is probably our greatest value that we get for the you know the, the money that that we put into it um, and that uh, I know has always uh, we hear it on a very well why do we pay for this and well do we don't even need Michelle's group then if we've got this GPEC thing because economic development is a very um, mystical or mysterious kind of, uh, you know, uh, to the public how it works. So it, this, was a, this was great information to see. I'd almost like to see it for everything that we <laughs> – but I don't want to have staff to do that. But um, I think just to point out that, you know, the, what we get for this is, is a huge value to us. And, uh, and I appreciate, you know, all of the staff down at GPEC to – you know, drive this kind of kind of result for us. So, thanks. We have some more questions here in a moment, but uh, so let's just reassure them they can go to the website. So, just quickly give them a statement: what's on the website? That all this information is on there, and uh, you, you can go to it. Most of it, isn't that right? On the website. Yes. So, Mayor, the uh, information on the community and how we sell. Uh, to our prospective clients in terms of value propositions is on there. This level of detail or data, that specifically we prepare that you know, for the council, um, but it's okay. not available on our website. Okay. But we'd be happy to share it after the meeting. Sherry? Uh, first of all, I do want to thank you for your presentation because it's, it's really interesting. I'm glad it's going to be on the website because there's a lot of information there that our, our citizens don't really know that's going on. It's basically we're selling. You guys are basically the salesman for the region, and I think that's really important for them to know that. Um, one question I saw in the paper with Chandler that companies about the water issue. We've tried to really work with our water issue with our CAP water. Any thoughts on that? Councilman, so water is, is from a brand perspective, if you, I think there was an article, the New York Times, I believe it was three weeks ago, and it talked about the shortage on the Colorado River and, you know, thrusted Arizona and California as if we were running out of water. Yeah. And, you know, the CAP and the thought leaders that, you know, were involved in the CAP, you know, decades ago set us on a, you know, an entirely different trajectory than California. And so it's important that we get not only that word out more regionally and statewide, but also the communities, you know, you all have very different positions on water. Um, and as you can showcase your water plans, I think those are going to be, you know, become more and more important, uh, particularly your creative use around, um, you know, gray water over time, because again, that's that specific Chandler um, article was around, you know, the, the major utilization from the um, microelectronics sector and how they're reusing gray water, um, you know, for parks, for golf courses. Uh, and there's, there will be, you know, longer term questions about, you know, TDS in the water. And I, I'm, if our water folks are here, that's, that's about the extent of what I can get into. But you know, the VOCs and others that are in the water, there's a lot of questions about the future of, of how we will dispose of the, of the water on the back end. But uh, that is something that is, it gets brought up. And usually what happens when we start getting really specific questions about water by community, we'll ask our economic development directors to bring in the water experts. So, because that's, you know, generally beyond our ability to communicate. But water nationally and certainly West and Colorado River water uh, it's really important that we go, as I talk to my executive board, on the on the offense, because otherwise we're going to get painted in a very negative picture of, of having no water. Thank 
Rand, the last question, because it's five yeah, to I know, six. I know okay. that. And yeah. so I will follow up with you, Chris, on my questions. Um, just wanted to say thank you for the last eight years that I've been on this council. I really have valued um, GPEC and the, the help that you've given our, our city. And uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, and finally, I want to thank you, Chris. I have to tell you that since I've been on the GPEC forever, since I've been on council, uh, through this period of time, and um, the strength that you brought to the cities has increased over the years, and how all of a sudden mayors became a group that you met with regularly, and that wasn't happening before. If you happened to be on the board, you were there. But now that unity uh, that you brought to all the mayors and the cities, and that with that uh, brings lots of information and collaboration. So thank you uh, for all that you do. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think I want to clap on this one. Okay, we have five minutes to the city clerk before I, uh, do you, are we going up there? Are we staying here? We're, We're going up there. We're going up there. Yeah. Okay, so there, if there's no, informa no information items. I'm going to adjourn this meeting. We'll go to the dais for the second meeting.